Our interview today is with Dr. Earl Butts. Uh, Dr. Butts is Dean Emeritus of Agriculture at Purdue University and was Secretary of Agriculture during the Nixon and Ford administrations. I'd like to begin, Dr. Butts, by asking you to tell us a little bit about your farm background and what first brought you to Purdue University. Well, I grew up on a 160-acre family farm in northeastern Indiana. It was a typical family farm, I guess. We farmed with horses. We had cattle and hogs and a few sheep and a flock of chickens and home garden and everything else you did in those days. We developed a work ethic. What brought me to Purdue University? Well, it was a county agent. I'd been in 4-H club work. And when I graduated from high school, I kind of looked toward law and toward medicine. One day the county agent says, let's go down to Purdue. I'm going down. And I jumped in the car and came along with him. Went in the office over here at the dean's office. Vern Freeman was an assistant dean over there. He'd only been out of college himself about 12 or 15 years, but he seemed like an aged advisor to me. Uh, so I got here, and it's been a terrific career because of that decision. Mm -hmm. Well, as you indicated, you've had a long association with Purdue University as an undergraduate and later as a graduate student, I believe the first Ph.D. in agriculture economics from Purdue University. You remember the economics uh, uh, faculty here and head of the agriculture economics department and then later dean. What, in your judgment, has been some of the major contributions of uh, Purdue and what has made Purdue a leading school of agriculture? Oh, I think a variety of things. One is we've been pretty close to practical problems. Always have been. hope we always continue to be that. Uh, I, I think our undergraduate education at, in the School of Agriculture Purdue has always been a very practical one. I think in the School of Agriculture we got some of the best teachers at Purdue University. Uh, our students get some of the best instruction. It's good hands-on instruction. It's practical as well as theoretical. It's on the cutting edge of knowledge. I think we've had a close association between teacher and student, a good teacher-student relationship in the School of Agriculture. We stressed that when, when I was teaching myself. Uh, I've had a very exciting and rewarding professional career, but as I look back on the thing that I got the most satisfaction out of, I think it was meeting students in the classroom at Purdue University. Well, speaking of your career, you focused primarily on agricultural policy, both as a teacher, a researcher, and, and clearly in the, the public policy arena. What attracted you to agricultural policy as an area of specialization? Oh, I think a variety of things. The involvement of government in agriculture. I, I'm one who feels we've just got entirely too much government in agriculture. And we've had that for years. But what attracted me to it, I, I think, well, first I was assistant secretary for three years in the Eisenhower administration when Ezra Benson was secretary of agriculture. Uh, he invited me down there, and this was right after the so-called Brandon Plan. I'm talking history now. But it was a controversial plan, and it involved big government involvement in agriculture. I went down there three years as assistant secretary and had two or three agencies in the Department of Agriculture under my general supervision. Uh, it was exciting uh, to be a part of that team. And I, I think with that experience, uh, I was attracted to this agricultural policy field where uh, farmers are now so involved in government, or government are so involved in agriculture that a farmer's got to go down to his county ASCS office to get permission to farm from some young squirt there that can't tell a cow from a coyote and tells him, you're going to violate this regulation here and you don't qualify for government payments. Or you're going to run a tile back here to this back 40 where some duck landed two years ago and we're going to fine you for it. I think that's too bad that we got agriculture in that kind of a straitjacket. You mentioned that you found it exciting in Washington when you were there in the 1950s as an assistant secretary, but you later had a chance to go back in the 1970s uh, as Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, I wonder if you'd share with us some of the uh, significant contributions you think that you made during your tenure as Secretary of Agriculture for the United States. Well, I went back there with a philosophy of too much government, that we ought to get the, get the government out of the agricultural business as much as possible. Uh, during my tenure as Secretary, we sold the storage bins that the Commodity Credit Corporation had all around this circuit. Uh, one of the quotes that, that often uh, shows up in the press that uh, you were, uh, at least some people think you said uh, back uh, in the 1970s was that we ought to have all farmers plant fence row to fence row. Uh, and some critics will say, well, yes, the secretary said that, and so I went out and overexpanded, and I bought more land, and I bought more machinery in, in the late 1970s, and then the 1980s came along, and uh, times were difficult, and uh, many family farms faced foreclosure and bankruptcy, and there's still some today who, who claim that they're uh, suffering from uh, overexpansion. So I guess my question for you is, uh, Dr. Butts, first of all, did you say that, that farmers ought to plant fence row to fence row, and in retrospect, was that good advice? 
I probably said it. I said a lot of things when I was secretary, and I expect I did say it. <clears throat> but it was the market who dictated the farmers plant fence row to fence row. Prices were up. Exports were good. And the market, <clears throat> the market dictated expand your production. They not only planted a fence row to fence row, they tore out the fence rows. I can't even find the fence rows out there now, and I guess that's because of large tractors and large combines. But be that as it may. But Marshall, if you don't produce it, you can't sell it. And if you have this program we've had for years of curtailing production and telling the rest of the world we're going to cut back and we're going to raise prices and cut back, that's not the way you expand markets. What we've done in our program around here is we've put our, we've put our prices up here with our price supports and then we've curtailed our production and paid our farmers not to produce. Uh, we've sent a signal to the rest of the world that, that we're not going to be a reliable supplier. We sent a signal to the rest of the world that, that, that we're going to cut back on production. We got high prices. We sent a signal, you expand your production on your marginal acres and your fragile land, and then just undersell the U.S. by a few dollars a ton, which is precisely what they do. They made us the residual salesman in the world's marketplace. Uh, undersell us uh, $10 a ton until you empty your bins and your warehouses, and then the world can take what's, what they need from the U.S. And that's the position we've gotten ourselves into, so that now we've got to heavily subsidize our exports to, to, to dig out of the pit that we've dug ourselves into. Well, since we're talking about trade, let's explore that just a little bit further. Uh, as you suggested, uh, agricultural exports have become very important to this country in the last two decades. In fact, today, roughly one-fourth of uh, farm income comes from export sales. Uh, and you've been a strong advocate of, of free trade and expansion of agricultural exports. Uh, why do you think this is the correct position? And why are some of the folks who talk about protectionism perhaps in air in their, their views? Well, exports are important. As you say, a fourth to a third of our total, for some of our grains, it's more than that. I mean, I mean we produce enough wheat in this country that we need to export 40% of it or cut back. Uh, we produce enough corn, we need to export 30 to 40% or cut back. And soybeans the same way and, uh, and cotton the same way. Uh, but, but what are we doing here now? Uh, we're, we're cutting back and we maintain our exports now only at very heavy federal expense. We got the Export Enhancement Program. Uh, we've got the market promotion program abroad. We've got that program that's under criticism these days, in recent days in the Congress, uh, where, we, uh, where we put money out to these various commodity groups to develop markets abroad. And it becomes really a subsidy for the, for the marketing group, you see. So we maintain our exports now with very heavy federal subsidy of one kind or another. I'd like to see us move into the point where we are price competitive. What have we got here in America? We've got a unique, a unique resource in America, Marshall. If you take this middle America from the Appalachians on the east, clear to the Rocky Mountains on the west, from Canada on the north, clear to the high plains of Texas on the south, you've got the world's largest contiguous land mass with fertile soil, with adequate rainfall nearly every year to do the kind of farming we do there, with uh, this marvelous uh, temperate zone growing climate, long periods of sunshine in July and August, right when the corn plant's doing its job, with highly capitalized farmers, high management capacity farmers, a good infrastructure to deliver the fertilizer and chemicals we need, a good infrastructure to process and market. Then put that terrific water transportation system right down through the middle of it that makes, that makes Peoria, Illinois almost as close to Rotterdam freight-wise as it is to Springfield, Massachusetts. Not quite as close. You can't duplicate that any place on the face of the earth. And what are we doing? paying our farmers not to use it. What are we doing with our high price support program? Sending a message to less efficient production areas around the world, expand your output as U.S. comes back. And then we got to spend a lot of money to subsidize our exports. It doesn't make sense. Now there's some critics that say that this free trade just means lower farm prices and lower farm in income. And what we ought to do in this country is manage our agriculture and trade like they do in the European community or Japan. How do you respond to those critics? Well, you talk about free trade. <clears throat> I'm looking at this camera right here now and I see Sony on the camera there. Uh, I mean, a Japanese camera is taking pictures of us right now. You think that's right? Hmm? If you came from Rochester, Minnesota, where Eastman Kodak is, you'd say nuts to that. We ought to have some American company. We didn't pay for that Sony camera there with Japanese yen. We don't print Japanese yen. We paid for it with American corn and soybeans. And I think it was a pretty good exchange. Uh, we, make, uh, we make soybeans better than they do. They make cameras better than we do. One of the things that's happening now, uh, Dr. Butts, is the United States has been involved for about six years or more in this Uruguay round of trade negotiations. And in the last year or two, we've been involved in what's referred to as the North American Free Trade Agreement with Mexico and Canada involved in those discussions. 
uh, while neither one at the moment have been uh, ratified, let's assume for the moment that they are ratified by the U.S. Senate uh, uh, in the near future. Do you think such trade agreements as these two are, are good for U.S. farmers and U.S. agriculture? Absolutely. The North American Trade Agreement, a little while back, I spoke up in Alberta, in Edmonton, I think it was, uh, when this uh, U.S.-Canadian trade pact was hot. And it was probably hotter in Canada than it was down here. They asked me to speak on it. The title of my remarks, even the ducks got brains enough to fly north and south. And I said, we should be as smart as the ducks. Of course, it makes sense. Now, some people are going to be hurt, but on the other hand, some will be helped, too. And we'll all be helped by having more goods available at a more reasonable price if we trade on the basis of, of comparative economic advantage. Let me turn to a little different direction, but still relating to trade. I know that one of the things you take great pride in is the fact that when you were Secretary of Agriculture, uh, that you traveled to, to, to Moscow and what was then called the Soviet Union, uh, and that you met with Brezhnev in his office. I've seen the picture uh, in your office uh, of the two of you together, and, and you began uh, uh, nearly a 20-year history of large grain sales from the United States to uh, the former Soviet Union. But now we've seen some rather unprecedented political and economic changes in that part of the world. Uh, I really have two questions for you. One, what do you see uh, in terms of the future for that region of the world? And secondly, will the United States continue to have a role as an exporter to the uh, Eastern European countries in the former Soviet Union? Well, I'm optimistic about it. Uh, yeah, I was in Brezhnev's office, and, uh, and with remarkable frankness, uh, we talked, Brezhnev talked about his breadbasket, the, the Ukraine on the North Shore, the Black Sea. And I recall he said, he said, in the Ukraine, we only have about uh, 1,200 millimeters of rainfall. That's uh, about, 15, about 14 inches of rainfall, something like that. And he says, with 1,200 millimeters of rainfall, neither the communist guide nor the capitalist guide can grow corn. And I said, Mr. Brezhnev, I wouldn't know about the communist guide. The capitalist guide would have some difficulty with that kind of a situation. That's his best agriculture. And there they are with a population in, uh, in former Russia. Uh, roughly, it's as big as the population of the United States. A more. And we hear about their food situation right now. But nobody's starving in Russia now. If you're content to eat brown bread and potatoes, they want some of the things that made eating, makes eating exciting for you and me. They want some eggs for breakfast. They want some bacon. They want a little meat at night. They want some fresh fruits and vegetables. And I'm talking about meat now. And you know, that's the way we measure how well we eat. You, you talk about going out to a steak dinner, then you fill in some, some of the rest of it. Or you went out and you had a, a pork chop or something, you fill in the rest of it. You make that out of corn and soybeans. And that's the very stuff we make right here in America is corn and soybeans. And I think that poses a, a great potential continuing market because Russia is a marginal agricultural country with a population of over 250 million people. Uh, that far north, uh, the, uh, the Ukraine is roughly the latitude of the twin cities in this country, Minneapolis, St. Paul. As I used to tell my good friend, Senator Hubert Humphrey, that's too far north to be of any count anyway. But this is the best agriculture in Russia, up there where, where the season is too short to grow corn. And you simply can't grow the kind of stuff that, that makes the, the red meat and the dairy products and the poultry products that you and I enjoy in our diet and just take it for granted in this country. That's what they need, and they're going to pay for it. Uh, Dr. Bush, you've uh, long been an advocate of increasing agricultural production in the world to feed a growing world population. We now have about five and a half billion people in the world, and uh, some of the demographers project it will exceed six billion people in the very near future in the 21st century. And yet at the same time, we have a growing concern in this country and in many other parts of the world about uh, the environment and uh, the use of fertilizers and pesticides. And so my question for you is, can we reconcile these problems of, on the one hand, trying to produce more food to feed a growing world population at the same time to try to avoid uh, uh, harm to our environment? Well, Marshall, if we don't reconcile them, we're going to have mass starvation somewhere around the world. I think you're right. One of the real problems we face in the generation ahead is to feed this exploding population. If we don't feed them better than now, I think there's no point for the diplomats to try and get a peaceful world because I, oh, I think about a statement Gandhi made 50 years ago, I guess, in India. He said, even God dare not approach a hungry man except in the form of bread. Uh, and I've seen hungry men on the other side of the earth. No, he's talking to them about democracy, about human freedom, about human decency. They listen only to the man who's got a piece of bread. And that's the language we are prepared to speak in these United States. Now, uh, you say we run into conflict with the environmentalists. That's right. But after all, we need, to, we, we need to take some risks. I want to live in a risky world. 
uh, we've always been a nation of risk takers. And I think our biggest danger right now, Marshall, is that under this drive for 100% safety, 100% purity, uh, we might stop taking risks. That's the biggest risk we take right now is we might stop taking risks. Uh, you don't insure your car for all it's worth, uh, you carry some risk yourself. You don't insure your house for all it's worth, you carry some risk yourself. You but some of these pure food people come along and say, let's eliminate all risk. Well, I want to optimize the risk-benefit ratio, and I think we need to do that. We need to be safe, of course. We need to protect the environment, of course. But uh, now we're off on this binge of endangered species. We must protect this spotted owl, for example, the endangered species. We're going to use more chemicals. We're going to use them carefully. We're going to use biotechnology. We're going to use it carefully. We take risks all the day, every day, in many, many ways. But we, we, let's assess the benefits that come from them. The benefits that flow from the use of chemicals and biotechnology and increasing amounts of science in our food system is that we feed ourselves so well, we feed ourselves so economically, uh, and we can use food as a powerful weapon in this exploding population around the world. You know, many people view you as a, a strong advocate or ally of the agribusiness sector, uh, a strong supporter of freer markets, uh, agribusiness-oriented policies, and yet some are concerned that those policies are harmful uh, to the American family farm. And so I'd like to ask you, what in your view is likely to be the future structure of American agriculture as we look towards the, the year 2000? Well, first, let's don't bash agribusiness because, after all, those of us on the farm need somebody to process our stuff. They've got to get it so that, so that we now bypass the American kitchen. They've got to move it right through all these food channels, through the delicatessen section of the, of the grocery market. Let's don't bash agribusiness. But the family farm, I know that's been a political myth around here to preserve the family farm. You know, Marshall, we don't have family farms today. we got a family with a farm. Farming is now big business. Farming is now science. The modern, uh, the modern farmer has to be, uh, his inputs are science, our technology, our capital, our management, a little labor. He doesn't put in much labor anymore. Uh, we've got to, we talk about the average farm, you know. We make a mistake talking about average farm figures and average farm size and average farm income. If you average my salary with Lee Iacocca's salary, you get a pretty respectable figure. It doesn't represent either one of us very well. And here we are in American agriculture now with what, uh, a little under two million farms, as we call the farms. But the census says that anybody who sells a thousand dollars of farm products is a farmer. Well, that's phony as a three dollar bill. You get a lot of these people out around the, in suburbia out here who've got, a, who've got a, a flock of sheep or a little acreage. They do their farming weekends and nights. They got a job in the city. Uh, they sell a thousand, they sell fourteen dollars worth of farm products. We call them a farmer in the census, and they've got forty acres, and we average that in with some farmer out here, a legitimate farmer out here in the middle of, of Indiana or, or Iowa or Illinois, uh, who's got a thousand acres now, uh, who farms it with uh, himself and one hired man or, or, or son or his wife helping on it. Uh, he's today's commercial farmer. Uh, we got uh, under two million farmers, but something like. You got the figure, something like 10% of our farmers produce something like 70% of our farm produce. Uh, they are the farmers, are the others, there's a place for them. But let's don't get our total farm policy to keep them afloat. They live pretty well. They've got a job in the city, or the wife's got a job in the city, they've got a little farm income. Uh, they got the best of both worlds. Uh, but let's, just, let's, let's don't call them farmers and average them in with these others who are now our legitimate commercial farmers. Well, we began by talking about the fact that you began on a, on a small family farm, uh, farming with horses and a, and a technology of yesteryear, and uh, spent a career at pre-university as well as in public life, and including one of the highest offices in this land, a member of the cabinet of, the, of two presidents of the United States. Uh, there are some young people who will listen to this interview and will say, well, what about me? Should I consider a career in the policy arena, and particularly as it relates to agriculture and trade policy? And, and what advice would you give young people as they consider a career in policy and how can they prepare themselves for such a, an experience? Well, I certainly would encourage any person interested in this to, to do it. Agriculture, food's going to be in the forefront around the world. And, and I think it's going to be increasing in the forefront around the world. It's going to be critical. Uh, and the United States is in the driver's seat here if we let ourselves take charge of this thing. Should a young person look forward to work in agricultural policy? Absolutely, I think. Uh, trade, agricultural, pricing programs, governmental programs, uh, get active in politics. I think he should be well informed. 
uh, he should be able to discuss these agricultural, broader agricultural issues intelligently with his legislators and his congressmen and his uh, political, uh, the, the people who run the political parties to which he happens to belong, uh, make himself known. He ought to be able to make his views known in the, in the press, in the letters to the editor, or whatever it is, be articulate about it, because after all, food is going to be in the forefront. In, in, in world diplomacy in this uh, generation ahead. As I said a while ago, up to seven, up to seven and a half or eight billion people, a 50% increase in this generation in population in the world, and we're going to feed them. Uh, and I, 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 think, I think any young person should prepare himself to be an active player in that arena. It's going to be one of the world's most important arenas. Well, I want to thank you for a, a very informative and, and informal interview and we appreciate your time today. Thank you, Dr. Butts.